Okay, so it's five after the hour, and um, there'll probably be a few more stragglers that'll tune in, but um, I think we're good for now. So um, welcome, everybody, to um, uh, a brown baginar, as I've called it. Um, this is an informal awareness session that uh, is coming to you from the Sierra National Forest. My name's Sam Prentice. I'm a hydrologist here based in Bass Lake. Ranger District, and with us today we have Dr. Emily Fairfax, who is um, streaming from us uh, from CSU, Cal State University, Channel Islands. Um, before we get started, just that general announcement. Uh, please, everyone, just be mindful of your audio. Make sure that you're on mute. Um, usually, it's not that big of a deal, but in this instance, um, this invitation actually went viral to um, some thousands of Forest Service people, as well as other interagency colleagues and so um, just uh, mute your phones, mute your microphones um, so there's no background interference and you're not that person um, as sometimes we accidentally are from time to time. Um, we'll quickly get into it. Um, let me just introduce our speaker. Um, Emily is an assistant professor of environmental science and resource management at Cal State University Channel Islands. Um, her background um, was in um, classical training in physics and chemistry at Carleton College, um, double, uh, double bachelor's, and she went on to um, get her PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder, where she also got dual certificates in college teaching and hydrologic sciences. So uh, quite a depth as well as breadth of um, earth science background as well as teaching. Um, She's currently heavily involved, not only on the research side with respect to the beaver fever, um, but also a lot of the um, outreach that surrounds this topic, which given the number of participants and the fact that you all here are listening is you know, a testament to how much it's really resonating with uh, us in the resource community as well as the research community. Um, I met Emily at um, AGU, a uh, fall conference, um, last December. And the reason I invited her uh, to give uh, this um, bag, uh, Brown Baginar was not just because of what it was she was communicating and the research that she was doing, but also how she was going about communicating it. Um, some of you may be on Twitter, maybe not. You've heard the term SCICOM, sort of science communication. The basic premise of it is that um, science is dealing with a real crisis of relevance. Um, there's piles and piles of literature about what we need to do with global ecosystem science um, as our planet becomes increasingly strained um, by climate change. Um, but not a lot of that information is really getting through to a lot of the um, decision makers, um, the power brokers, um, the, the people who have money to fund that sort of thing and the will to see it through. And so obviously we're also suffering from information overload in the Forest Service. Um, and it's difficult to try to mentally sift through that, right? Hence all the talk about our bandwidth, you know, the new buzzword. And with buzzwords these days, we've got the beaver fever, right? And we also have resilience, um, which is oftentimes not really quantitatively defined. And that's where remote sensing really helps us. And so Emily's talk was actually going to touch on um, a lot of that. And um, hopefully you had a chance to check out her um, stop, uh, stop animation um, film on feature at on YouTube, but if not, um, sure, we can redirect you back to that. Um, and I'm just looking forward to um, hearing this presentation again, introducing it to you all, um, introducing her to you all. Hopefully, you'll all reach out to her um, after the fact. And um, uh, we're going to do the Q and A that follows through the chat box, given the number of people who are in attendance. So if you have any questions, feel free to just you know type them up, and um, we'll uh, we'll circle back to them at the end. So with that, um, Emily, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation, Sam. I'm super excited to talk to you all about Smokey the Beaver. Um, so many of you, I would guess, have heard of Smokey the Bear, and I am absolutely trying to steal Smokey the Bear's thunder right now and rebrand him as Smokey the Beaver. 
And hopefully by the end of this webinar, I'll have you all convinced that we can embrace Smokey the Beaver a little bit more and how we approach managing um, wildlands and riparian zones throughout uh, North America. So uh, Smokey the Bear has sent us some mixed messages through the past. Most of us have heard, you know, only you can prevent forest fires. But then I was looking up Smokey the Bear's posters and some of his you know, outreach materials and they kind of made me feel a little bad. Um, it was our most shameful waste and like Smokey's there holding this sad Bambi and pointing at this just absolute inferno. Um, it's kind of giving us some side eye and you know, it's this shameful waste and it's weakening America and like it's our careless matches that are starting this fire. And that didn't really resonate with me, especially in the current you know, climate and landscape around wildfire. Um, out here in California, I would argue that often it is in fact not my careless match, but perhaps a careless power line um, that is starting some of these big old wildfires. And another thing that was kind of coming out when I was looking at these is that there's a very negative portrayal of the fire. Um, the fires are these horrible, destructive things and they're destroying habitat for everyone and Bambi is sad and the bears are sad and the little baby bears are sad with their hobo backpacks ready to leave because of this fire. And it just kind of felt like it was outdated to me. Like, okay, Smokey, this was a great message when we were really, you know, not sure what we were doing with wildfire and not sure if they were good or bad, but science has come a long way. And I think that maybe the goal shouldn't always be to prevent forest fire. Maybe it should be to manage it a little better. So Smokey the bear, he's coming in here and he's got this real fire prevention focus. Uh, he also relies heavily on human intervention or us modifying our behaviors. So Smokey's message is like, this is on you. You have to do this. And a lot of us just don't have time or we don't have power or there's nothing that we can actually do. And so it's almost a discouraging message. It's like only you can prevent fires, but then here we are. Fires are not being prevented. So that's my fault, but I can't do anything. So that's just frustrating. It's not really moving us forward. Um, he's also really pushing that outdated like all or nothing approach to wildfire. It's either a shameful waste or we have a green forest. There's no in between. And from my work on fire and just my time living in the American West where fire is a very frequent part of my life, I don't, I'm like, I'm not on board with Smokey. And I was thinking more about it. And I think instead of Smokey the bear, which I do know is technically Smokey bear, but I never learned it that way. And this was a heated debate that started after I published the title of this talk. I had a lot of people being like, you know, his name is Smokey Bear. So, you know, if you're gonna criticize him, at least try to um, get his name right. And I was like, okay, sorry. Um, but regardless of his name, I would like to introduce a newer fire mascot, Smokey the Beaver. So unlike the Smokey the Bear message, Smokey the Beaver is going to be putting forth more of a fire moderation focus. Um, beavers and the way that they interact with the landscape can do a lot of wildfire prevention without actually needing any human intervention. And I don't know if any of you have tried to even just like organize a meeting, but getting a bunch of people on the same page can be really, really challenging. Um, so any sort of a fire perspective or fire management strategy that does not rely on humans, in my opinion, is a much more likely to succeed one. Um, Smokey the Beaver also is not about all or nothing. Fires can be really good. Fires are a very natural part of many ecosystems. Um, one of the issues that we see during fire is when they destroy habitats that don't have an easy time coming back, or they destroy habitats that are already um, brought down to very, very low amounts throughout the landscape. Wetlands and riparian zones in particular are a very sensitive habitat that we have unfortunately lost much of in the American West. Some states have lost uh, upwards of 90% of their wetlands, and with that goes a lot of sensitive wetland species. And so maybe instead of trying to do blanket fire prevention, we can just try to sort of tone down fire on the ecosystems that are no longer equipped to handle it as well, and let the fire do what the fire needs to do in the ecosystems that still need it. So I was interested in this Smokey the Beaver being our new fire mascot and thinking about how, you know, we could take a different approach to working with nature to prevent and moderate fire in a strategic way instead of just doing the whole, you know, only you can stop it, end of the story, fires are on you. So to do that, I had to stop and think, okay, how exactly is it that beavers could protect a riparian ecosystem during wildfire? I was looking for leads. I'd heard people talking about this 
So sort of off the hand and I'd seen some interest in it in the news like 10 years ago and I was like, you know, this seems like it could be something that actually happens. Maybe beaver dams are related to wildfires somehow. So I reached out to a woman named Heidi Perryman who runs the Martinez Beavers Worth a Dam uh, nonprofit in Martinez, California. And she's like the beaver whisperer. She knows all the beaver people and gets us all in touch with each other and helps us find leads and make connections when we need it. And I was like, Heidi, I'm really trying to figure out, you know, the relationship between beavers and wildfire. I'm really interested in thinking about how we can work with beavers to prevent uh, wildfire destruction, especially in California for sensitive ecosystems. And she was like, oh, I have the best video for you to watch about beavers and wildfire. It's exactly what you're looking for. Um, so this is what she sent me. When rangers fight these blazes, they get help from an unexpected corner, the beaver pond. So I saw this and I was like, okay, wow, very cool. I had not actually thought about the fact that you could fly a helicopter uh, with a firefighting water bucket and scoop water from the beaver ponds. A um, little worried that what if a beaver got scooped up in that bucket, it'd be very sad. Um, this is really, really cool, but like totally not what I was thinking of. I am trying to focus on ways that beavers can build sort of fire resiliency without us. They don't need our helicopters. They don't need our firefighting strategies. They can do this on their own. So to help me sort of come up with a conceptual model, I needed a visual for how beavers might interact with wildfire in a landscape. And if you watch the teaser video, you've already seen this, and if you have not, this is your chance. Um, this is my conceptual model for how a beaver dam might sort of prevent fire or moderate fire in a landscape. So, you know, it's, it's stressful, right? The fire comes through and it's burning and there's the sensitive wetland ecosystem, but because the beaver has, you know, made this pond and stored all this water and dug these channels in the landscape, spreading that water out, it stays green. That's what I was thinking. Um, but just because I could think something and make it out of felt doesn't mean that it actually happens. Uh, so the next steps were to sort of take a step back. Um, I have this visual for how I think beavers could maybe prevent fire. From damaging ecosystems, but I needed a way to test it and to tie it back to the physical changes that beavers actually have in a landscape. So for those of you who have not been to a beaver pond or have not seen a beaver before, um, this is a, somewhat what you would see if you walked up to one in the field. Um, obviously we've kind of cut through in the landscape um, so that you can see underwater and see inside their lodge. You don't actually see inside their lodges in the field. Um, but what you have here is the beavers have built a dam. Um, that's the structure on the left-hand side that is long, uh, made of wood and sticks and stones and some mud. And the purpose of the dam is to create a pond. The beavers need the pond. They are really, really amazing creatures, super, super clever. Um, but if you've ever seen a beaver on land, you know that they are a little bit um, awkward. They are not particularly spelt animals. Um, I often show people this drawing of how I envision beavers on land. They're kind of like spheres. Um, they're very soft, jello-y animals that are basically chicken nuggets walking through the landscape for predators. But as soon as you get them into the water, that all changes. A beaver in the water is a lot like an otter in the water. They are much more spelt and they can swim really fast and they can get away. So we have the land beaver, which is absolutely like prime pickings for a predator, 
but then in the water, the beaver is safe. We actually don't have any predators that can easily get a swimming beaver. So they build these dams so they can have a pond, so they can live in, so they can be safe from predators. It's kind of a roundabout way, but um, it's not that dissimilar from us building houses to protect ourselves from the elements. Now, when beavers want to you know, get out into the landscape, what they do is they actually dig channels from their home pond out into the landscape so that they can float back um, trees and other building materials to their home pond to add to their lodge, the structure they actually live in, and their dam, the structure that's creating the pond. These little channels they're digging are essentially water highways throughout the landscape, and they can extend hundreds of meters or even kilometers from the home pond. And they fill with water. So these are like little irrigation channels the beavers are digging. And they're doing all of these things. They're making massive changes to the landscape 100% so that they can have a safe house and water highways to escape predators. But in doing so, they have a lot of secondary impacts on the landscape. And when those, those landscape impacts, they're really, really clear when you look at them from above. So this is a satellite image of a beaver dammed stream. And there's a lot going on here. And if you're like me, and you've spent way too many hundreds to thousands of hours looking at satellite images of beaver ponds, you know exactly what you're looking at. And you're like, wow, that's a lot of dams. Uh, if you're not in that boat, that's totally okay. Uh, I'm gonna highlight some of the key features. So highlighted in the pinkish color are all the beaver dams in this image. There are a lot of them. Um, it is actually probably one to two families that is maintaining all of these dams. So it's not like one beaver, one dam. It can be one beaver, or one beaver family, and then a whole bunch of dams. They use a lot of these secondary dams to create more sort of safe spots in the landscape, but then also to help them store extra water and protect against flood waves. Highlighted in light blue are those channels I was talking about that the beavers dig out from their pond so they can access other parts of the landscape. Beavers just want these to be their water highways, but these are also spreading the water out and keeping the plants greener and keeping this water spread throughout the riparian corridor instead of just right next to the beaver pond or just right next to the stream. Highlighted in the uh, light pinkish purple color, that's the beaver's lodge. So I found one lodge that looks active in the satellite image. So that would mean there's one family of beavers that is maintaining all of this complexity in the landscape. All of these dams, all of these channels, all of this water storage, it's the product of one family of beavers. Now family of beavers is usually two parents, they're monogamous, they mate for life, and then every year they have between one and two babies. The babies are called kits, and for the first year, they don't do anything except leech off their family and live in the lodge. In year one to two, they learn how to build dams and they practice with their families. So the baby beavers will stay home for about two years before they then go away and try to build their own dams. Sometimes the parent beavers will actually follow the baby beavers upstream or downstream and help them build their very first dam, which is kind of cute. It's like when your parents say, okay, go to college, don't come home. Um, you're on your own now. Uh, and then they go back and they sort of continue maintaining these landscapes. You can have hundreds of beaver ponds and hundreds of beaver dams on a pretty small stretch of stream. I've seen densities of over 25 uh, dams per kilometer. So that is a lot of beaver dams. And if you think about stretching this all the way up and down a watershed, suddenly you're looking at a lot of water storage. So on the left, you can see an undammed section of creek with the main thread highlighted in yellow. And on the right is the beaver dam section of that same creek. There is a lot of complexity in the beaver dam section. In the undammed section, it's just not there. There's a lot of reasons for that. Overgrazing is a big one. Um, habitat change and destruction from people is a big one. Draining wetlands is a big one. There's a lot of reasons why streams can get to sort of this unhealthy state. Um, and there's a lot of ways back to get to a more healthy state, and beavers are one of them. So they're making these really big changes to the surface hydrology, but they're also making some really big changes to the subsurface hydrology. And so I've drawn this sort of white line through both of these pictures. We're gonna look at a cross section with depth, so into the soil, to see how the beavers have affected the water underground. So when we're in a not drought period, so when it's nice and rainy and everything, um, you don't really notice the impact beavers are having. In the top section, that is an ordinary creek. You can see the stream and its effect on the water table. There's all these little plants and their roots are reaching down into the soil. If the roots mm -hmm. can reach water, they're happy. If they're not, they're not happy. But here, everything can reach water because you have precipitation infiltrating. It's not a drought period. 
In the Beaver Dam Creek, we have a much wider pond. We have lots of little channels, these little micro streams surrounding it. But again, since there's rain, it doesn't really matter that it's there. Every plant can reach water, every plant is fine. Didn't need the beavers. But as soon as you put that into a drought period, all these plants that can't reach the water table or can't reach the streams effect on the water table, they'll start to wilt. In this beaver ponded area, because we have the bigger pond that stored a lot of water and because we have all these little channels spreading it out in the landscape, being irrigation channels, all of these plants can stay greener, even if there's not rain. And this effect can persist as long as there's water stored in the pond. And these ponds can be very large. They can store months worth of water. So then taking that one step further, what happens when you have a bunch of really dry plants? Um, all it needs is one careless match or maybe one careless power line and you can get a fire. And so when you have a fire start, it's very easy to burn dried out vegetation. But in these beaver ponds where this, all the vegetation has been able to access water, it's been able to stay much greener, much lusher, it's gonna be really hard for that fire to get burning. It might smolder a little, you might get some little toasty bits on the edges, um, but as long as you have this water being spread out by the channels and being stored in the pond and stored in the soil, you're not gonna get really big fire. The plants are gonna be able to stay green and resist burning. Not the case on streams that don't have that extra water storage. And so this all happens in theory. This all happens in my conceptual model and in my felt model. Um, but does this happen in the real world? And so this is a fire scar and a photograph um, from Idaho. The fire was the Sharps fire that burned in 2018. And the photograph was taken by Dr. Joe Wheaton from Utah State uh, University. And it is of a beaver dammed riparian zone. And so we're looking in this photograph along the riparian zone and there's a big old beaver pond in the middle. And if you look around the beaver pond, all the plants are green. And if you look outside of where the beaver has had its influence, everything is burned. And so if you're looking at this and you're thinking like, okay, well, it's the hills that burned, but not the riparian zone. It doesn't have to do with the beavers. Um, look deeper into the photo, look further downstream and you can see the riparian zone uh, downstream, it actually did burn. Um, there were not beavers in the downstream section, and that part uh, was fully engulfed by the flames. But in the part where we had the beaver ponds, the fire wasn't able to burn it, so it either blew over or it just stopped. But that area stayed green. So this was really impressive to me, and I'm like, this happens, this conceptual model happens, but now I have to prove that it happens everywhere. How do I know that this isn't just sort of a fluke, and these beaver ponds had something else going on that made it so they weren't going to burn, or maybe the fire just had some weird wind or something, and it's a freak occurrence, not, not a pattern. So in order to observe and measure this fireproofing, uh, I turned to remote sensing. I'm a remote sensing scientist by trade. I really like going outside. Um, I really like going to beaver ponds. I really don't like taking field data at beaver ponds. They are like you're waist deep in mud. There's all sorts of water and plants and bugs and you're hiking and it takes four hours to measure a single pond. So I'm like, uh-uh, get me some satellites, get me a computer, I'm good to go. So the first thing I did was I downloaded all of the fire perimeters uh, for the Western United States over the last decade. This was a lot, a lot of fires. It kind of made me realize how much the landscape does burn um, and that there's not really anywhere in the American West that I would consider to be fireproofed. Everything is burning. Um, so it's just a matter of how intensely. Then I went through all of these perimeters using Google Earth and I tried to figure out which ones were really big fires. Um, I wanted to look at intense fires to kind of find the end member of this behavior um, that were also places that I knew were beaver habitat. So they had big riparian areas or they were by aspen trees or maybe they were by some willow. Um, I tried to figure out where the fire burn area and the beaver habitat overlapped. Once I found a couple of burn scars that fit that cri criteria, I actually went in and I mapped every single beaver dam within them. This was a lot of beaver dams. I believe it was a little bit over a thousand beaver dams. Um, it was a lot of work, uh, but it was interesting to see. There were a lot of beaver dams that were in these fire, fire burning areas. It's not like you know beavers are so rare that this isn't gonna happen everywhere. I found this happening in pretty much every Western state. Um, at all sorts of different scales, from just a few ponds in, the, in a burn scar to several hundred ponds in a single burn scar. So once I found all the dams, I found the fires that contained the dams. Then I went through and pulled the Landsat satellite images uh, from before the fire, uh, one year before the fire, and then during the fire, so actually while the fire is burning or within two weeks of the fire burning, and then uh, 
after the fire. So a full year after the burn, what does it look like? And I pulled the NDVI uh, along all of the riparian zones within my fire scars. So the NDVI is the Normalized Difference of Vegetation Index, which is basically a measure of how green your vegetation is. Going through all of these steps, what I was able to do was compare the vegetation greenness of the riparian zones that had beaver to the ones that did not have beaver damming and see how they sort of behaved as wildfire impacted the landscape. So before there was a fire, how did, the, how did the greenness look in the two different areas? During the fire, how did the greenness look? And then after the fire, how did the greenness look? So let's actually get into the data and the results, the fun stuff, like there's a lot of lead up to it. So how big of an impact are the beavers actually having during wildfire? Is this the kind of thing where it's like one pond is preserved and nothing else? Is this something where like the whole landscape is protected? Um, on what time scale, on what spatial scale, that's what I'm interested in. So I looked at five different states that had five different fires that were all quite large. Um, the smallest fire was in Wyoming and it was 21,000 acres. The largest fire I looked at was in Oregon and it was 395,000 acres. So I wanna emphasize that these are very big fires. I'm not looking at little bitty brush burns. Um, I figure there's a lot of things that can stop a little bitty brush burn. And so it's not as easy to figure out whether or not the beavers are having an impact there. So I'm looking at these really big fires in the American West. Um, California, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, and Oregon. Since uh, I'm in California, and since uh, it had some of the best imagery available, I'm gonna focus on the fire that was in California. This is the Manter Fire. So it burned up in uh, the summer of 2000 in, in an area called the Domeland Wilderness. This is part of Sequoia National Forest, and the fire burned 79,000 acres. So what I'm showing you in all these pictures here, there's the burn scar on the far left, um, it was a big area. This area already is not super heavily vegetated. Um, it's called the dome land because it has a lot of these really big granite domes uh, popping out of the ground. But there is uh, the Kern River that runs right through the middle and that area does have more vegetation. In the middle, there's a picture of me standing by a beaver dam. This is just from this past October. The beavers have been here uh, as far back as I can see in satellite images all the way back into the 1990s um, and aerial images that I have access to and then they are still here now, and they're still building now. So these beavers have a, had a long history of occupancy in this area. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner is a satellite image of one of the beaver ponds complexes in this area. So this is a very, very big beaver wetland. Uh, <laughs> you can see maybe there's some dams in here that look like these little linear stringy features. You can look at the scale bar on the bottom. So the lodge, in this area is actually about 60 feet across. So it's like a New York apartment style size house for the beavers. And this pond has been there for decades. And you can just see how much greenery is around this beaver pond. And you know, I'm thinking this is an enormous amount of green, but this was also an enormous fire. So, you know, are the beavers gonna be able to protect that vegetation? Is this enough water stored to actually make it through the Manta fire? As I was thinking about that question more, I ran across uh, an article in the LA Times about the fire, and it sort of made me doubt myself a little bit. So this is a quote from the article. It is a humbling expression of nature, walls of flame 70 feet high, twice as high as the nearest tree, leaping through canyons and valleys, at times in five directions at once. Left behind, quite literally, is scorched earth. So this was a very bad fire. Um, this fire was huge, it had enormous walls of flame, it was leaping through canyons and valleys, um, and I'm going to tell you, like, I am all about the beavers, I think they are incredible creatures and they are wonderful engineers, but this seems like a lot. Uh, this seems like maybe the, it was too much for the beavers. Um, but I wasn't going to stop the experiment, I was going to keep going and keep looking at my data and see what it said, and if it says the beavers didn't make it, then they didn't make it. And if it says they made it, that's awesome. So let's see what the data says. So here is the NDVI of the Manter Fire Burn Scar. It goes from red, indicating that the plants are dead, up to blue, which indicates the plants are super, super lush. Um, yellow does still indicate alive plants. Uh, it could be plants that are not super dense or plants that are, you know, they're okay, but not super, super lush. When you have a really healthy riparian zone or really healthy wetland, you typically have quite high NDVI because the plants are both uh, green and they're densely packed. So when you see blue along these creeks, that means that is a booming wetland. 
Uh, if you see yellow, it's like, okay, it's fine. Um, and if you see red, that means that the plants are toast. So this is before the fire. This is the year before the fire in the summer, um, same time of the year the fire winds up burning next year. And you can see there's a lot of red and yellow in the landscape. It's not super green. I already knew that. This is a very rocky area. Um, highlighted in the dashed box is the Kern River and some of the forks of it and creeks of it. And you can see that along the river channel, there are some little streaks of blue. So there are areas that are quite lush and green along the river, even if the rest of the landscape is not quite as densely vegetated. And then the fire comes in and a lot of it is burned pretty significantly. What little vegetation we had in the landscape is toast and big sections of the creek and of the river seem to have burned. In the image on the left, you can actually see a very dark red area um, in the very top of it. That is the smoke plume. So the fire is actively still burning during this image. Uh, a lot of times with riparian vegetation, it can spring back so fast that it is hard to get an idea of the impact the wildfire actually had on it. But by getting it while the fire is still burning, like this is what it looked like during the fire. These plants, if they're still there, they made it through the fire. Then after the fire, it all sort of starts to spring back along the river. So riparian areas, they have dealt with all sorts of disturbance throughout their millennia of evolution. So they get fires, they get floods, they get heavy sediment, they get all sorts of animals coming, stomping through. Um, if they're disturbed, they can spring back. That's not really what I'm as interested in. I know that they can spring back. I know these ecosystems have a lot of resilience built into them. What I'm interested in is what's happening during the fire. So going back to during the fire, what areas were preserved? What areas weren't burning? If you're a plant and you can spring back, that's great. If you're a salamander or frog or fish, it's not quite as great, uh, especially now with some of these species very, very endangered um, or threatened. If you destroy a section of an endangered toad's habitat, that could be the line between this toad going extinct or this toad having a chance. And so preserving these areas where it's known that some endangered and threatened species thrive is really, really important. So to make all these patterns I'm seeing a little more clear and to actually show you where the beavers are in this area, I'm gonna zoom in a couple of times. So first, uh, on the very left is the satellite image of the creek we were just looking at. And so highlighted with the solid box is the area that I've zoomed in on the right. And then highlighted in the dash box is the section of those areas that have beaver dams in them. And so the NDVI images I'm showing you are sequence from 1999, then 2000, then 2001, before, during, and after the Manter fire. You can see that before the fire, all along the creek, uh, it's a brighter yellow, so it's healthier vegetation and more dense vegetation. And there are a few patches of blue that are within this beaver dammed area. So we have some lush wetland habitat going on. Fire comes through in 2000 in this middle image, huge sections of the creek just burn. Um, they go totally red, they blend in with the landscape around them. Some patches persist uh, in the areas without beaver, but almost the entire area that has beaver uh, seems to be doing okay. In fact, there's even still a couple of blue pixels in there. So there's some parts of this creek here that basically didn't feel the fire. And then 2001, so after the riparian vegetation has had a chance to pop back, you can really clearly see um, the stream corridor and how well it's adapted at coming back to life while the rest of the landscape stays burned. But that area that had beavers, it never really had to be um, destroyed. It stayed green the whole time. So this happened in that section, but there's beavers all up and down the other part of the creek, so let's look there too. So here we have beavers on the top of the creek and on the bottom of the creek uh, and not in the middle. And I really like this section because in the before the fire image from 1999, the section that does not have beavers, so the part of the creek that is not surrounded by the dashed box, is actually bluer in many places than the areas that had beavers. So it had really, really lush wetlands along it. There's a lot of reasons you can have really lush wetlands. It can just be a good spot topographically for it. Um, you can have things like log jams, creating sort of pooling. You can just have a lot of stream complexity from different geomorphic processes. So it was doing really well. Um, there was a lot of wetland. There was also a lot of wetland in the beaver dammed area, but it wasn't just in the beaver dammed area. You don't need beavers to have wetlands. But then the fire comes through in 2000. The areas that have beavers, they're totally fine. They stay super, super blue. They hardly even notice that there's wildfire happening. Um, and you can see the fire front. It came in from the right hand side of the image. And in that top section, it got up to the stream's edge and it stopped. It wasn't able to get through those beaver wetlands. 
But in the middle section, it came through and it just plowed through the whole area. It burned the stream, it burned the hill slopes on either side of the stream. Um, it did destroy that habitat and it did break up hydrologic connectivity and habitat connectivity in this landscape. But then after the fire, it all springs back because that's what rivers do. They spring back, at least the plants do. Frogs, not so much. Salamanders, eh. Um, but the plants were okay. So in terms of what the beavers are doing and what I'm seeing them do is they are preserving habitat during fire. They're not stopping the fire altogether for the most part. They're not making it so that it springs back faster afterwards. What they're doing is that they are keeping these patches of green healthy and happy throughout the fire. So if you're an animal that can't escape the fire, if you can make it to a beaver pond, maybe you can make it through. And if you think about way back before we trapped beavers, these ponds were everywhere. It was estimated that there was one beaver per kilometer of stream in North America. And so it doesn't matter how big of fires you had before, all sorts of animals could just book it to the nearest beaver pond and be okay. But now that we've lost all those ponds and we've lost all these wetlands, it's not so easy anymore. You can have hundreds of miles that have no safe spots, basically. And that's really bad for the species that need these habitats. So I see these patterns. I've hopefully pointed out these patterns to you, but I want to be able to quantify these patterns. I want to be able to put a number to it. So this is a map of the NDVI on the Beaver Dammed Creek during the fire. So we have in the two shades of green are before and after the fire, and in the brown is during the fire. NDVI, or vegetation greenness, is on our y-axis. X-axis is distance along the creek. Uh, and then the black boxes along the x-axis indicate where there are beaver dams on this creek. So this is as if I walked down the creek and I'm measuring how far I've walked, and then I say, is there a dam here? And what's the NDVI? The dashed yellow line indicates an NDVI of 0.3. So if it goes below 0.3, that typically means that you either have very, very, very little vegetation in this part of the landscape, or it's wilted or dead. If it's above that, it means you have a lot of green plants. So you can see in the area that has beavers, the area by these little black boxes, um, all three years look pretty similar, and all three years in general stay above that 0.3 dashed line. As soon as we get out of that beaver dammed area, around 1,500 meters uh, down the creek, the area that was impacted during the fire, it drops really, really low. And so we see the NDVI dips down between 0.1 and 0.2. The plants were dead. There's not really a way around that. Um, but before and after the fire, they were green. So this should be a green area. This was a green area, and this will again be a green area. But during the fire, it was not. Not the case where there were beavers. Where there were beavers, it was green all the time. They didn't feel the fire. So I took that difference uh, between the before and after and the actual fire and DVI itself, and I mapped that out to make it a little bit more clear the effect the beavers were having. So again, um, in black boxes is where there are beaver dams, distance along creek is on the x-axis, and now the y-axis is the difference in, in DVI. So this is the average of the pre and post fire minus the fire and DVI. And so if it's a low number, that indicates that it was less affected by the fire, and if it's a high number, that indicates it was more affected by the fire. And here you can really see, in that area that has the beaver dams, there's really not a huge effect uh, during the fire. Plants are like, okay, I don't know what's going on, I'm feeling fine. As um, soon as you get out of those beaver wetlands, it is affected by the fire. We see the NDVI plummeting, um, plants are burning, plants are wilting, plants are shutting down, the habitat is being really impacted. And I saw this everywhere. Every creek I looked at, I saw this happening. Um, but if you're squinting at the screen right now and be like, I can't see that. Um, same, it's really small. There's a lot better ways to visualize the fact that this happened everywhere. And so what I did was along each creek, I went through and I found the maximum sort of score or the maximum difference that occurred in NDVI. So where along the creek was the most impacted and what was that impact? And then I broke the creek into chunks. Chunks that had beaver dams, chunks that did not have beaver dams. Throughout the rest of this talk, if something is color-coded blue, that means it has beaver dams in it. If it was color-coded yellow, that means there's not beaver dams there. So once it's broken up into these chunks, I figure out the average difference uh, between those NDVIs in each section. So how much was each section impacted by the fire? And then I plotted them. So on the y-axis, we have that average difference in each section. So each section of creek, either with beavers or without beavers, plotted. And then what was the maximum uh, difference observed on that creek? So by doing it this way, I was able to account for the fact that not all these fires burned exactly the same. Some were more intense than others. Some were more uh, prone to large burning than others. 
And so by scaling it to the maximum difference on a given creek, that's saying, okay, this creek, it could have burned this much. How much of that actually occurred in each section is what I'm looking at. And so if it falls on the one-to-one -one line, that means that that section of creek burned as much as you could have expected given the characteristics of that fire. Can't get any points up there, so don't look for them. And then the further below this line we go, that indicates less fire damage and more fire resistance. So when I actually plotted my data points for every section of creek on all the creeks in my study from all five fires, this is what I saw. So the points in blue again are the areas with beavers, the points in yellow do not have beavers there. And as a whole, the areas without beavers were closer to that max damage line, indicating that they were a lot more impacted by the fire. As a whole, the areas that did have beavers were much lower, indicating more fire resistance. If you look at the slopes of these lines, it's a factor of two different. And so to really synthesize that data and bring it all together, what I did was I took those average differences and then I divided them by the maximum difference. This is just scaling it. So everything's non-dimensionalized. You can think about this as the percentage of max vegetation burning that actually happens on a given creek. So on this creek, 80% of the maximum potential burn happened would be a value of 0.8. On this creek, 40% of maximum burning happened. That would be a value of 0.4. So higher, again, is indicating more fire impact. And this is what those results look like. So these are violin plots. They're very literally at their core, a box and whisker plot. Um, but the width of the shading around it is indicating where the data points are clumped. Um, so you can really see the distribution of data within that box. And so in our area that did not have beaver, we on average saw about 51% of maximum potential burning happening. So that's a lot of burning. If you were going to see an NDVI reduction of 0.8 on some part of that creek, meaning some part of that creek was absolutely scorched, that means that on average, if you don't have beavers, you're gonna see an NDVI reduction of 0.4. And that's a lot. That's often enough to push you below that wilting line. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, in the area with beavers, we're only seeing 0.19, so 19%. So it's not that they don't feel the beaver or the burning at all, they do feel it a little bit, but it's not so bad. And I've just started looking at some of the surface temperature data that you can get from the Landsat satellites. And the areas that have beaver dams, especially in these broader, wider sections, they not only are staying green, but they're staying much cooler, um, relatively cooler. So the surface temperature in these areas will be about 105 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So still hot, not a great day. If you're in Phoenix, you're like, that's not that bad. Um, it's still warm, but it's not like you're dying. Meanwhile, in the rest of the landscape, we're seeing temperatures above 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it's burning, it's really, really hot, um, too hot to live. So these beaver dammed areas, they feel the fire a little bit, but they stay in a state where things can actually live there. They don't live there comfortably, but they can live there during the duration of the fire. And I tested these using some statistical methods to see, okay, it looks like these are different populations, they have different averages, they have different medians, the distributions are really different, but are they really different? Um, and the statistics say yes. Uh, my p-value was below 0 0.001, indicating that these are definitely different responses to fire. And so when you don't have beavers, um, your landscape will be responding differently to wildfire than when you do have beavers. And when you have beavers, it responds in a lot more um, resistant and resilient way. So to tie that all together, some take home messages for you. So beaver dammed areas, they store water in the soil. They're keeping plants green, they're keeping soil wet, and this happens even when you have a fire happening. Like right now, if it's burning right now, the plants can still be green and the soil can still be wet. If you're in an undammed area, um, you're gonna see that NDVI be reduced during fire pretty significantly, often to the point where the plants are either dead or wilted. This happened in all the wildfires in my study very consistently across the creeks that did not have beaver dams. If you had beaver dams, you're only going to be seeing about 19% of the max NDVI reduction, so only 19% as much damage. Um, if you don't have beavers, you're looking at 51%. So a significantly larger amount, about a uh, factor two and a half there. And you know what that really means for people and what that really means that's exciting to me is that beaver damming can be a very low cost and systematic way to just moderate the riparian habitat damage during wildfire um, but still let the fire happen. Um, maybe it's gonna stop the spread of fire if you have a really enormous wetland, maybe it's not. That's not really the point of this. The point of this is that when you have these sensitive wetland habitats, if you have beavers in there, they're gonna be working for free 
uh, you don't have to pay them. I've been an engineer in the past. I know how expensive engineers can be. Um, beavers work for the low, low cost of a few sticks and some peace and quiet. They're gonna be out there doing their thing, inadvertently creating incredibly resistant and resilient ecosystems. Um, it's really impressive. So all you have to do is let the beavers do their thing. It's a very hands-off approach. It's not us preventing wildfire. It's the beavers doing their work to just moderate the wildfire. Um, and so I'd like to end up this talk by saying that this is an active project. I'm working on showing that this happens in even more areas and trying to get a much larger data set so I can do some more statistics on it and maybe build some models. Uh, so if you're interested in helping or if you have some data or some beavers that you're like, you should look at these, I don't want to do it, but you should come look at them, please reach out to me and let me know. I'm always looking for field sites and any lead I can get is a lot easier than just having to comb through the fire perimeters and Google Earth. Uh, and so with that, I am happy to take questions. We can blow them up in the chat right on. box. Absolutely, people, please um, uh, put your questions in the chat box. And thanks, Emily. That was, that was awesome. And also um, a bit more uh, uh, fleshed out than that AGU. So that was cool to see some extra details in there. Um, while we're waiting for some um, some questions to come up in the chat box, um, I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're. It's pretty obvious to everyone who's watching it um, that you're employing a lot of um, techniques, communication techniques, um, have a heavy reliance on visuals. Um, I can only imagine the amount of hours it took to actually get that animation, you know, um, completed. So I'm sure a few people might be curious to know what that statistic is. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, science is, is all about substance. Um, and that's great. That's empirical knowledge, knowledge generation. But we're really kind of realizing that we're in an era where um, style and substance have to go hand in hand in order to really I think be an effective communicator and getting your message heard. So as a scientist from that culture, what's motivated you to play both sides of that? Ooh, I mean, I, as a person, I'm a very just like data driven person. I like to see the data and I like, I trust it and I've never had an issue with that. Um, but I also see sort of policies being made and I see people talking about beavers or talking about science issues and it just seems like there's a lot of misinformation or lack of information and it, I don't feel like people are malicious with it like someone will say you know I really don't like beavers they flood things they destroy things um, because that's based on their experience with beavers and I view part of my job as broadening the experience for everybody else so bringing some of the things that I see uh, from the data to them and it's also just a lot of fun. Like the felt video, it was, I spent a lot of time thinking about it, but then once I actually sat down to make it, it was about four hours to make it. I made it on my kitchen table. Um, the hardest thing was my cat kept stealing all the felt pieces and I'd have to like stop them and be like, Cheeto, please. Um, but it was a lot of fun. And then seeing people watch it and having people reach out to me, that was better than any like publication or um, great on a test or anything like that. Like people saw it and they were like, I don't know anything about beavers, but this was cool and I get it. Or, you know, I have hated beavers my whole life, but now I'm like, well, maybe they aren't bad. Why do I hate beavers? And just seeing that response, it makes me feel like the work I do is a lot more valuable than if it were to just go sit in some paper repository somewhere and not have an impact. I'm sure there's a lot of things I could do with my research that would be interesting methods development or cool quantifications, but if they're not going to make a difference, to me, it doesn't feel worth it to do. Um, well, questions are rolling in um, as, as expected. So um, I'll just kind of start it a little bit from the top. Uh, why was Nevada missing from the states you focused your data on? And uh -huh. if you need some locations, it's not Sounds like that, that forest, the humble Toyobi is raising their hand. Yeah, I would love that. I actually started working on Nevada, um, but I had pre-fire data and during fire data, but it was such a recent fire, there was no post-fire. So I knew where there were a bunch of beavers up in the Ruby Mountains that I wanted to look at. And I'd done a previous study on uh, Susie and Maggie Creeks and their drop buffering. So I really wanted to have Nevada, like I'm personally attached to the Nevada beavers. Uh, but I didn't have the data available, but now that this project like I started it a year ago, that data's there. So they're definitely part of the new stuff, the new data that I'm analyzing. Um, I would absolutely love to start working on some more Nevada data. 
Well, I reckon that your invitation to have people reach out to you is, is might end up uh, um, trickling in like a fire hose. So uh, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, uh, next steps as far as um, thinking about the physical processes that are um, that you're looking at. Um, someone's uh, wondering aloud, um, examining the difference in uh, wash load sediment delivery through a preserved versus burned riparian area. So um, any thoughts about, uh, I guess, thinking about um, the post-fire and longer term analysis of bed load or any other resilience uh, characteristics? Mm -hmm. So I've seen some very preliminary work coming out of Utah and Idaho where they looked at uh, stretches of stream that had beaver damming and then areas that were burned around it and they found that the beaver ponds were actually sinking out a disproportionately large amount of ash and burn material. And on one hand that's not great because beavers need to live in their ponds, but on the other hand beavers are active agents uh, in their lives and so they do dredge their own ponds and so once that ash has been settled out the beavers will dig it up and put it on the floodplain and sort of stabilize it there instead of letting it all just come streaming screaming downstream as fast as it can. Uh, I've only seen that being studied on one creek so far. It'd be really interesting to see if that's a commonality or you know what is the spatial distance over which that can actually function like when do you just start filling the beaver ponds too much. Um, but I definitely expect there to be a significant difference in the sediment characteristics upstream and downstream. Next question. One thing, that, one thing that struck me is that while BDAs may mimic many of the attributes of beaver dams, there would be much less wetted area and much less connectivity because there aren't the beaver channels. What are your thoughts on this? I think that's very accurate uh, assessment. Beaver dam analogs are really, really great starter points, in my opinion, and they can achieve some of the goals that beaver ponds have. So a good BDA, you can get some of the drought buffering and fire buffering, you can get some of the flood wave sort of attenuation, but without those channels and without the beavers to be maintaining it, it's a much, much more temporary uh, situation. And there's some recent research coming out of Canada that shows that after an initial bump, the BDAs, um, like three or four years later, they really aren't having a sustained impact. But I've also seen a huge number of studies and talked to a lot of scientists where they're trying to study a BDA, and so they build a BDA, and then they have to rebrand their study because a beaver moved in. And it was like, thanks for the starter home. Uh, so this happens a lot, which is a great <laughs> thing. Like the beaver shows up and it's like, I got this, take a step back. Uh, so while it's not great for the people who've had their studies derailed, uh, I think that beaver dam analogs are a great sort of transition to letting beavers and more natural processes take back over. Um, I got a question from a EPA colleague, um, keeping us on point, um, as the EPA does with respect to water quality. Um, any um, associated water quality uh, studies um, that um, you have um, joined with your work, or just general thoughts on how beaver are protecting water quality? Yeah, so beaver and water quality go hand in hand. Uh, there's been a pretty good amount of literature showing that within beaver ponds you get much much more denitrification and sort of water purification happening. You can get little patches of anoxic sediments and all sorts of cool bacteria doing interesting biogeochemical processes uh, but at a very like patchy spatial scale so that it doesn't become these massive like methane sources like a lot of big peatlands or huge bogs can be. Uh, so they definitely can do that and then at AGU I actually went to a talk that was looking at how some beaver dams have dammed up or have been built on a creek that is coming straight out of acid mine drainage. So the pH is two uh, at the top of it, and then there's a series of beaver dams. And as you go down the dams, the pH rises and rises and rises until after that sequence, it's up to seven. Um, so it's back to being like normal water. And she doesn't know if the beavers are actually living in all of the ponds. I mean, I, think, I don't think they would live in pH two. Like I don't live in lemon juice. Um, but they've created a system that's essentially through a variety of different, you know, groundwater surface water exchange processes and biogeochemical processes has remediated acid mine drainage on a small scale. Uh, so I'd be really curious to see if that's something that scales up. Yeah, that's interesting testament to beaver's own physiologic resilience if they can, you know, kind of occupy the, the such a wide niche of Different, uh, different pHs, that'd be crazy to investigate. Um, 
Great presentation. I wonder how difficult it would be to introduce beavers into areas that do not have beavers considering threatened and endangered species and habitat management direction. Um, so again, that's kind of some of the a comment towards some of the things that we have to deal with on the, on the management side. Um, have you worked closely with managers so far um, to, uh, to try to um, expand the scope of your work? I have not worked closely with them. I've had a lot of conversations with land managers, um, especially in California. I've started a lot more conversations about that. Uh, it's tricky here because you can't move beavers. You're not allowed to do any relocation, which is uh, problematic. So if you want beavers somewhere, you can't actually get them there unless they come there on their own. And for a really long time, you could do depredation um, to or trap and shoot beavers for pretty much any reason. And I'd seen a lot of the permit data and a lot of the reasons were like, I think the beaver is hurting groundwater. So it's like not even necessarily based in science, uh, which is frustrating. But um, policy is shifting. We're starting to see uh, sort of more beaver focused things happening. So even out here, you're no longer allowed to trap and shoot them for whatever reason. Um, you still can't move them. But I'm seeing beavers that were occupying stretches of river that had a difficult time getting past private land um, start to move through it now. So they don't, they're not stopping on people's property, but they're going and they're expanding their habitat. Um, we have a lot of them in the Sierra Nevada mountains that want to get down by the coasts. And getting through the Central Valley has been historically a very difficult thing for them. That's where a lot of the permitting for trapping happens. Um, but now that that's off the table, I'm hoping to see, and I think I am starting to see in aerial images, the beavers you know, creeping down more. Uh, building beaver dam analogs, great way to attract them. If you can do relocation, it, there's a number of tools uh, and models that you can run to see what kind of habitat is good for them. Um, time of the year matters a lot. If you plop them down in late fall, they're not gonna have time to get their food cache ready and they're all gonna die. Um, it is kind of tricky because they are living creatures. Like it's not like dumping wood or gravel and just hoping it works and if it doesn't, nobody's hurt. Like if you relocate a beaver, you try to bring in a beaver to a habitat that's not gonna support it, it's gonna die and that's not good. So it does take a lot of thought to figure out how to get them there and what the best strategy is, if that's active relocation, if it's just habitat restoration and waiting for them to show up. Um, I've seen them show up from 100 kilometers away, so they can move pretty far, but it's definitely case by case. Hmm. Uh, Brett Goldfarb's book mentioned that in the past 200 years, we removed several hundred million beaver from the US. Um, when you're out in the wilderness, are you seeing the signs of historic beaver dams? And I guess I'll just tack onto that question. Um, what is the life cycle of a beaver dam as far as um, how long it persists um, and whether it persists after, um, whether it needs maintenance, basically? So we definitely have lost most of the beaver. They were between uh, like 200 and 400 million and now they're currently at about 12 to 25 million beavers in North America. Their all-time low was like below a million. So real success story there. Um, beaver dams can persist for an extreme amount of time in the right conditions. So if it's a lowland, if it doesn't have really flashy hydrographs and not a lot of big spring flows that are going to come pushing on the dam, uh, the dam, since it's made of sticks and stone and mud, over time it sort of just becomes a berm or a landscape feature. So I've been to some beaver dams up in the high Rocky Mountains that are completely earthen now. Most of the sticks inside have begun to decay. Um, there's still a few embedded in it that you can tell are very clearly uh, beaver chewed. And you know, plants are growing on it, trees are growing on it. It's become a permanent landscape feature and it is holding water back still. Um, that doesn't happen everywhere, but it can. There are beaver dams that have been uh, drawn in trappers journals from 150 years ago that are still there, identical. Um, that you can see in satellite images. So they definitely can persist a really long time. Uh, and I do see some really old ones, especially high up in the mountains away from people. I think that uh, um, a lot of the questions have uh, turned now to just um, kudos um, and some comments from you know the different, uh, uh, the different corners of where you're reaching out to. Um, Oh, here's an, uh, another late entry. About 60 years ago, beaver were parachuted into the state's backcountry forests of Idaho. You showed that that video. I assume that was the Idaho example. I've seen, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great yeah. video. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the more interesting stories of, you know, the Forest Service world. Um, <laughs> did you find any of these locations and were the Beaver family still there um, when you were panning around, uh, you know, with your image tiles? Oh, man. So I love that video, for one. I've had it in a number of my talks before. And one of my biggest uh, kind of oops moments was I was on, I was giving a talk to a group of engineers and I tried to show that video and their sound wasn't working. And so it's playing and like the best part is this kitschy like 1950s narration. So I, I had to try to like recite it from memory. It was hilarious and awkward, um, but it's one of my favorite videos. So for those of you who haven't seen it, they perish, they put beavers in boxes, they put them in small planes and then they pushed them out of the plane with a little parachute attached and then it plopped down in like various mountain meadows and it opened and the beavers walked away. Um, I, it's an interesting strategy. I'm not sure who proposed that and got funded to do that. But in general, if you don't do a full habitat analysis, you can expect 70 to 80% mortality uh, during relocation. So I'm guessing most of those beavers, although it was an interesting photo op, uh, did not make it. I don't know that they did full habitat analysis based on the narration saying they were just being dumped in mountain meadows. Um, but that being said, there is a lot of beaver damming in Idaho. Uh, a lot of the mountain meadows have beavers. So I don't know how many of those are descendants from the parachuted beavers. Uh, be interesting to find out. I wish they had taken some sort of genetic samples to see how many of them have repopulated Idaho. Um, but there is a lot of beaver damming in Idaho and there is, uh, I think, a lot of positive beaver policy and attitudes towards beaver up there. Yeah, and I guess we get marks for creativity on the Forest Service side, right? <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> um, I just, uh, I'm going to cherry pick one more um, question. It seems like the, the crowds are, are pretty, pretty sated, which is great. Um, but um, there's a threshold where extreme fire behavior basically just, you know, runs rampant. We see this with ec post-fire ecological effects um, in many different ways. And you, you kind of touched on it. And, in some ways, uh, these beavers are creating these islands of resilience. Again, this buzzword that we're kind of converging around as managers, you know, what confers resilience and obviously backing up water on the landscape is, you know, in the semi-arid west, the foundation of that resilience. So are you, um, are you thinking about um, how you might quantify some of these indicators of the persistence or the diffusion of that resilience? post fire um, because that sort of information um, would gain a lot of traction with us um, when we're trying to demonstrate um, basically that the taxpayers money is being well spent um, if we want to preserve these sorts of features. Yeah, so that's something I'm really interested in. Since starting to look at these satellite images, I've wondered, are these patches sort of the nucleus for spread of recovery? Do they enhance that? Do they make it faster? Um, what kinds of species are recovering is another thing that I'm really curious about. So if you've preserved like the wetland habitat, are those wetland plants going to be able to come back out regardless of their typical um, status as either like a primary colonizer or not? Um, do we get to skip some of the stages of that ecological succession if you have these nuclei, a fully developed ecosystem there? I'd love to partner up with some ecologists that can do things like fish counts and frog counts to see how those populations actually persist through these fires, because I focus almost entirely on the vegetation. Um, in order to do the nucleus for the vegetation study, I do need a lot more frequent imagery. So I've started, um, I bought a drone, and I've started looking for ways to figure out how to fly like daily uh, images over burn scars when they happen to see like what actually happens day to day uh, around these beaver ponds. Are they like, shrinking and then growing? Do they just stay perfectly still and then stuff pops up around them really randomly? Um, it needs a lot finer resolution data, but I'm confident that over the next year or two, I'll be able to get some of that data. Mm. Excellent. Well, I think with that, um, like I said, just a lot of kudos rolling in and um, I wanna add to that pile. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us to share your work. Um, you know, obviously you, uh, Oops. Caught myself there. Only one technological malfunction. That's not too bad. Um, but obviously, you touched a nerve with a really provocative title, uh, "Smoky the Beaver." You know, we're really wrestling with you know the overtaking of um, the fire focus, and we want to be more engaged in restoration. And we need to recruit partners. And this 
rebranding that you're kind of putting forward is really, um, uh, like I said, it really resonates. So thanks for sharing and good luck with your work. I would encourage everyone who's participated to um, contact Emily if you've got potential target sites um, or you'd like to um, engage in some uh, higher level partnerships. I'm sure she'd be welcome to hear about those opportunities. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, with that, um, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you so much.